And I made one of a very controversial statement. I was like, sometimes there's no such, th- sometimes you're not gonna get consensus. Right, like full stop. yes. And I think it's like hard because every planner is like, no, we've been taught like, no, we're gonna get everybody in the room and we're gonna do all this great engagement and we're gonna get there. You're not gonna get there. There are gonna be times you are just not going to get there. And it's okay. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Veronica O. Davis, author of the new book, Inclusive Transportation. Uh, we're gonna be diving into the details of her book and talking a little bit about her journey as to how she got into transportation. <laughs> it's a great one, uh, but it's a long one, so let's jump right into it with Veronica O. Davis. Veronica O. Davis, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation with you. So, Veronica, I love giving my guests just an opportunity to uh, introduce themselves. So, who is Veronica? <laughs> who is Veronica? That's like real philosophical. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, Veronica Davis, um, I am a very proud New Jerseyan. That's where I was uh, raised. I was born in the DC region. <laughs> Um, but I was raised in New Jersey. Um, I went to the university of Maryland. So my coffee mug Mm -hmm. is going to be the university of Maryland today. Uh, The Terps, there you go. The Terps, proud Terps. We lost this, lost, lost football recently, but we're doing pretty good. Yeah. And then I went to Cornell for grad school. Um, so I am a engineering nerd, transportation nerd. Uh, I love all things transportation. On my honeymoon, I was taking pictures of the transportation infrastructure in the Cayman Islands because it's just that much of a passion. Currently, I'm the director of transportation and drainage operations for the city of Houston. Mm -hmm. Um, But this interview will just reflect my personal views and not the city of Houston. Yeah, yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna go into uh, all that 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 work stuff uh, so much. I mean, it'll it'll permeate through because as I think you you do a great job. And we're gonna talk a lot about your new book. Uh, you talk about in your book that this stuff is like you were born into this. <laughs> Literally born into it. So my uh, my grandfather owned Lincoln Cab Company in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and operated it up until his death uh, when I was about uh, 10 years old or so. Um, and then that's when they they sold the comp- the family sold the company. Uh, my dad is a civil engineer. We moved to New Jersey because he went to go work for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. He worked for CSX. And then he was the executive director of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And then my mom uh, went for New York City Transit Authority. So I was literally, and, and I was almost born in the US DOT building. So my dad worked for UMTA, uh, Urban Mass Transit Administration. And uh, my mom went in the labor waiting for my dad to come out of a meeting at the uh, US DOT building. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah, I'm lit- literally born into it. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, but that's, that's an interesting thing too. You know, oftentimes, you know, when your parents are sort of involved in something, you don't necessarily head in that direction. And especially a subject as, as challenging and difficult as engineering is, you know, it's like, it's not like, oh yeah, no, I just fell into the family business and da da da. You fell into the family business, but at the same time that, that required a heck of a lot of studying too. Was that sort of a, a happenstance sort of thing? I mean, or did you oh, like grow up dreaming of being an engineer? <laughs> no, not at all. So my sister, I have an older sister, and so she ended up being a doctor. Okay. Um, and so she's now at University of Maryland's medical school. She's got like five titles, so please don't make me say <laughs> <Right>. them. <laughs> but she's doing some really awesome stuff in the medical world. But, you know, no, growing up, I actually didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, my sister knew from a very young age she wanted to be a doctor. I just kind of lived life. But, you know, as I look back, I think the signs were there. And I, I share this a little bit in my book of I had a Lionel train set. And I used to uh, go in the basement of my house and make the training uh, set. And then I had the little people. I don't know if you remember, um, like the little Fisher Price people, they were about this big. Uh, But I had the house, an airport, a parking garage, a farm, a school, and I would, you know, set everything up around my Lionel train set. 
And I had my My Little Pony world. I had G.I. Joe, which were the defenders of the entire community. I had Barbie world. And so if you think about it, it's the elements of urban planning or city planning, regional planning. Right. Uh, it, it was there. And I knew that you had to have a train to move goods and people. Um, so I think pieces of it were there. I was always curious. When I was eight, my family gave me um, a radio and I took it apart because I wanted to see what was inside. I couldn't put it back together, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but that cur- but there, um, there's a curiosity there. Yeah. It was a curiosity. And, I, and I'll give my parents a lot of credit, which is how they ended up with two daughters in the STEM. It's uh, They very much gave us microscopes, chemistry sets growing up. And they really fostered uh, our curiosity. And so for my sister, it ended up on the medical side. And for me, I really just was good at, I don't know, I really, I I didn't really have direction. Even as I applied to school and as a high school student, I remember um, I was like, all right, I guess I'll put engineering, but I didn't really know. And when I started at Maryland, I was actually engineering undecided. and I, and funny story, I declared civil engineering because uh, I walked out of a chemistry exam three weeks into the semester. And I was like, what can I do that I never have to take another chemistry class after I get through this class? And that's how I declared civil that day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can relate. I, I was down the path uh, that your sister was on in pre-med. And so I was heavy into the uh, the organic chemistry and, and all that fun stuff. And yeah, it's I could see doing that, <laughs> especially now that I spend my time, you know, uh, like you, uh, thinking about how our built environment, uh, you know, really impacts uh, behavior and, and, and the way that we live our lives. And it's interesting, too, because I thought about this as you were just mentioning about that environment that your parents had set up. There's a lot of uh, analogies there to like how we build our communities and how that helps, you know, you know, set the stage for, you know, how we interact with our, with our environment. It's, it's so incredibly important. Absolutely. And I think it's one of those things that as a child, you just don't know it's a profession. Like you don't realize that there is somebody who is planning the future of your city, your community. Um, and so again, it was just a me as a child playing in the basement without much guidance and still getting to, a level of community planning and community organization. Yeah, yeah. Now you you you, you hinted a little bit there about the book, so let's just pop right on over to uh, the title page here and uh, inclusive transportation: a manifesto for repairing divided communities. Talk a little bit about the origin story of uh, wanting to dive into and, and and go through the the arduous task of actually writing a book. <laughs> So I'm going to say this, there's always the origin story. The original, original origin story is um, it's the initial seed that gets planted and takes time to germinate and grow. When I was 22, I worked for New York City Department of Transportation. I was a graduate intern in the Office of Private Ferry Operations. And one day I just didn't really have a lot to do because I was an intern and I wrote this life strategic plan at 22 years old. And I, you know, wanted financial vitality. I wanted, you know, professional acumen. I mean, I wrote this one objective statement that I wanted to be a world-renowned transportation expert. And in that, I had different ways that I was going to achieve that. I was going to get my professional engineering license. I was going to testify at Congress because I feel like if you testify at Congress, then you're an expert. And I've done that twice now. And I also had in there, I was going to write these books and I was going to be of different genres and I was going to be an author. And that was it. Didn't think anything of it. Um, And that was back in the summer of 2002. That's how long ago that was. And so that's just kind of the seed of a thought that just kind of lays there. Fast forward to 2018, I was on a panel about a project I was doing in West Philadelphia, and it was on just spaces. And it was looking at not just who is using public spaces, but who is not using the public space and why. And how do you begin to have justice in public spaces? And there's things of formal policing, informal policing, things that make people feel unwelcomed or in a space. 
And I was presenting on that in Philadelphia uh, with my client and one of the people on the, the task force that we had created. And this woman walks up to me after and she's like, wow, that was amazing. Have you ever thought about writing a book? And I was like, yeah, you know, back in 2002. <laughs> but she handed me her card and her name was Courtney Lynx and she was with Island Press. And we got back to DC and had an initial meeting. And I was like, oh, okay, let me kind of sort this out and figure this out. Um, and it took about two years to get to a an approved outline um, because it was time. It was, what did I want to be in this book? What did I want the users, the reader to feel? What did I want the reader to do? And we went through several iterations. So we went through six different iterations of an outline to get to the book. Um, and then that's when I got my uh, contract with Island Press to start writing and it took about two years to write the book. Um, and some of it was going back and listening to old keynotes and old presentations that I've given <laughs> and flushing out some of those ideas. And then some of it was, I think, the delicate balance of being able to, and I talk a little bit about this in the preface of when do I need to say something clearly and when do I need to dance and when do I need to introduce nuance and when do I need to just put something out there and let the reader figure it out? And, um, and my initial editor, so Courtney was my initial editor, and we danced for probably about 18 months uh, to get the book where, you know, it would need to be content wise. And then I went through my, my final stages of editing with the, the other editors. And so that was the process. That's the origin story. And um, there's a lot of tears and whining along the way. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm avoiding writing my book. <laughs> He's got it. You know, I'll tell you this for anyone. It's the tears about, and the whining. It's the tears and the whining. But what I yeah. also found was just doing something every day. So it got to a point where there were times I just couldn't write anything and just nothing was coming. And then there were days I was like, all right, let me just sit in front of my laptop for one hour and I will type anything that comes to my mind. And it was, in a, and I literally have some you know, documents that are just random one lines here and there. And it was just like a pouring of like everything I just wanted. And I got those one liners in and a lot of them have been very impactful and the things that people are quoting, but it's because I was able to get them in and deviating from the plan. So even as you start writing, you, you know, I had my outline of what I was going to write about and I didn't write an order, believe it or not. So I did write chapter one first I wrote chapter four second. Chapter four was actually my favorite chapter to write. And it was, <laughs> and you could probably tell, I'm sure as you read, you could probably kind of pick up on some of those things, but chapter four was my absolute favorite chapter to write. Two and three were the hardest because I was trying to separate what goes in two, what goes in three. And so in the editing process, those are probably the most heavily edited, not necessarily grammar, but just the content of what goes where so that it can flow. Chapter six, I rewrote. So I had a, a different plan for chapter six. And then I moved to Texas and I was like, nope. I was like Kermit the Frog, like, you know, that Kermit the Frog meme when his like hands are going. Um, and so I had to like truly, truly rewrite chapter six. And that is, you know, chapter six is really my call to action for people in the industry. That's my chapter I wrote specifically for the advocates even though they're not the primary audience, I still wrote chapter six specifically for them. And then obviously the preface is one of the last things I wrote. So I didn't write everything in order. Yeah. And, you know, it all came together. And again, I just, you know, every day I'm like, if I could just write for 30 minutes, an hour, whatever comes in my head and I'll figure out where it goes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and not to pass over the uh, fabulous forward by the amazing Tamika uh, Butler. So that's fantastic. And Tamika is part of my heart and brain trust. I have multiple group chats with her and, you know, a really fantastic person. Tamika did read uh, one of the versions of my book um, and gave me really great feedback. And so I, I made some additional edits based on some of her feedback. And then I'm really honored that Tamika wrote my forward. Yeah. Yeah. That's 
Fantastic. Now, I'm honing in on chapter four. The reason why I uh, jumped over to this visual here is you you mentioned chapter four as being your favorite chapter and you went right to that. Uh, But you didn't say exactly what the chapter was. So now we can see that. Ah, power, influence and the complexity of people. Uh, There's a lot of juicy stuff there. (laughs) It was a lot. It was it was, you know, the basis of that chapter. So speaking of Tamika. Um, Tamika and I and and several others had an opportunity to go to uh, Salzburg uh, for Salzburg Global Seminar. Um, And so for any of your listeners, um, I highly recommend if you're able to have an opportunity to go to Salzburg uh, for the Global Seminar, really try. And so what it is, um, it is just a meeting of the minds where they just bring people together from all over the world for about a week to just grapple with the topic. I feel like our topic was something about built environment and build infrastructure and public health. I don't really remember the exact title, but part of it is just bringing people, you know, people from the different European countries, South Africa, Brazil, New Zealand, China. And so it's literally bringing the people from the world together. Um, and then within the different professions. So you had people there who were doctors, public health people, uh, community activists. I was, I'm an engineer, people on the planning side. And so it was a melding of all of these people to grapple with this topic. And one of the things that we wrote coming out of this was power and privilege and just talking about what that means. And so chapter four basically takes that initial framework that we came up with with Salzburg Global Seminar and then fleshing it out and making it specific and relevant to the transportation world. And with that, you know, I talked about the different stakeholders, um, the people in power, the naysayers, the champions, and then the silently suffering and the complexity of all of that, because there are going to be naysayers that they just don't want the project. And it really doesn't matter. There is no concession other than don't do it. But then there are some people who might be naysayers, but they actually have some legitimate concerns. And, you know, how do you begin to parse that that stuff out? And so I just really talk about that. I share in that chapter my experience learning that the D.C. DC has library police. And I find that out the hard way because they shut down a public meeting. But, you know, just really talking about some of my experiences dealing with people and having that understanding and really walking away with at the end of the day, we have to focus on the silently suffering. We can we can jibber, jabber, jibber, jabber, jibber, jabber. And the same people are still dying on our roads every day. The same people are impacted on the roads every day. The same kids have asthma because of transportation uh, every day. So it's really like taking that once you're done all that, that, that jibber jabber, you know, at the end of the day, we have to focus on the silently suffering. And it's not that they don't care about the project. They are just literally trying to survive day to day. And it's working, you know, multiple jobs. It's working shifts. It is just trying to put food on the table and so when that's your day to day, going to a public meeting is a luxury that they just don't have. Right, right. And I love that term, too, the silently suffering, because it's so... Uh, acutely uh, encapsulates the challenge here. And one of the other things that you mentioned is your book is that, you know, we have this challenge that we are trying to change a system that inherently doesn't want to change. Mm-hmm. That and we're trying to change a system that isn't necessarily designed to get you the best decision. And I talked about this recently in governing of, you know, if you look about, if you look at a highway project, a highway project, there's a benefit cost analysis, sure, but the bar is not really all that high for a highway project. And it's not that hard to have the benefits, right? You just have to have the number of people driving, the number of trucks, you count the commerce that's moving and and all of those things. But then when you look at public transit, and the bar that a public transit system has to meet to get funding, right? There has to be a financial plan. There's got to be a ridership plan. And it's all of these things that are unknown. And I think the other challenge with transit is there's a lot of intrinsic values that's hard to capture up front, right? If you look at any major city that has put in um, transit in the last 20, 30 years, you see the economic impact 
of having a transit station. And I'll just take it back to DC real quick. And that's where I spent most of my adult life. You know, I remember um, in college when the Columbia Heights Metro Station was it was was built. I remember it was built and it was open and there was they, there were things there. I'm never going to say there was nothing there, but there were there were there was, um, you know, strip malls, low density development. Now, when you look at that particular intersection where there's a transit station, the amount of development that that, that is there, there's a target, you know, there's it's high rise buildings. And even from a pedestrian perspective, that is probably one of the heaviest pedestrian corridors. So we know that transit has the ability to do these things, but the problem is it takes time and no one really looks at things over time and the impact over time because there's an impatience when it comes to public transit. There's a perception that because I'm paying to use transit, it should break even and it should not cost. Meanwhile, we all know, and I'm sure Active Towns has done, you know, several conversations around this. We know that our usage of highways, we are not paying the true costs and the subsidies that go into highways. And so intrinsically, you're, it's hard to get to a good decision um, because of that. And even when you look at funding active transportation, but even if you look at funding walking and biking, it's very hard when you look at the benefit cost analysis, because it might be $5 million to install a sidewalk. And it's like, oh, but you're only going to benefit a couple hundred people. And it's like, ah, so I think it's just, there are things that are there and we just have to begin to rethink some of those. And I hope that as we march towards the next highway bill, we can start to grapple with some of that. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you put a lot in there that I'd like to unpack. And, and additionally, I'm looking at chapter three here is, you know, should there be a quote unquote war on cars? And I, I've had Doug Gordon on a couple of times on the podcast, and we've talked a little bit about the, the tongue in cheek nature of, of where the war on cars came from as a name of the podcast. But it's interesting, too, because even just in the last couple of weeks we've seen in the U.K., uh, you know, the, the prime minister, you know, basically, you know, actually putting this in a manifesto of his own. Uh, I mean, did, did you just like have to pinch yourself and say, what had just happened? You know, I'll <laughs> say this. If you had asked me before I moved to uh, to Texas, I probably would have been like, unbelievable, this guy. Yeah. You know, um, but living in Texas, I'm like, I could believe it. You know, I, I <laughs> you know, ne- yeah. I know next yeah. door is its own like, you know, place in like, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know the, 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 yeah. the pits of humanity. I don't really don't know what to call next door. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, <laughs> the, there's the original intent and then there's what's happening. But what has been amazing to me is to see people put in writing yelling at parents, like, why are you walking with your child to the park? Just drive your child to the park. It's safer. And so there is this kind of push pull. And I, I was at a, uh, an event and uh, one of the, the candidates said, oh, Houston's never going to be a walking or biking town. It's a car town. And it's like, what? <laughs> And that's where I think it gets to the silently suffering because, you know, people will say no one's biking in in, in like places like Houston or Arizona or others because it's too hot. And it's like it doesn't matter how hot it is. There are people that are doing it because they have no other choice. And that's that's typically who the silently suffering when someone says no one bikes. That is a lie. And I have been I've worked in many communities up and down the East Coast, the Midwest, the South. And yes, there are people biking. Even when you don't think they're biking, they are biking because they don't have any other choice. You don't see them because they're not biking while you're driving to work. So you drive to work in your little hour and that little peak hour in the morning and you drive home in the peak hour in the afternoon. But you have no idea what's happening in the middle of the day because you're sitting in an office all day. You have no idea what's happening at night because you're putting food on the table for your family or putting the kids to bed or reading a book or doing whatever you do at night. And so while you're sleeping, there's people moving around. While you are at work having your 18th meeting that could have been an email, you know, there are people who are moving around and going to work. And that's a mindset we're pushing against. And and it becomes a challenge. And so am I surprised? No. 
Um, I think it's the thing that we face. In, and even in even working in cities that have been very dense, like Philadelphia, like D.C., where you think people should be like, oh, yeah, you know, gung ho because we have a legacy transit system. It's hard there. Try to take away a parking space. Go to D.C. and try to take away one parking space and let me see what happens to be a fly on the wall. And so there's this like sense of we've equated a car with freedom. A car has become our identity. And that's partly because of, you know, the marketing campaigns, you know, the Lexus. And you know, every Christmas, there's that Lexus commercial with the Lexus and the big old bow on the top. And it's like, tell, tell her you love her. Uh, there's a lot of ways to tell somebody you love them without having to buy them a Lexus. And in the, and the reality is, um, I was reading an article recently, and I wish I could remember where it was, but it was talking about not even just the expense of ownership, but even in the used car market, it is still, um, you're still looking at, you know, $400 a month just to pay the car note on a used car. And I was like, geez, I don't, I don't have those problems. But, you know, I just can't even imagine. I'm going to ride both of our cars till the wheels fall off. Yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting too, because, and and we didn't really address exactly what the prime minister said and did in his manifesto, because honestly, it's kind of like almost mind bogglingly silly, but really what it was is sort of a, um, it's sort of like this knee jerk reaction that takes place. It's human nature really. And when the status quo feels threatened, it feels to them, like they're being discriminated against, <laughs> you know, and 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 I, that definitely came out in his little like bullet points. Oh my gosh, this is classic human behavior reaction. It, absolutely, and I and I talk a little bit about that in the introduction of you know, for every action, action there is an equal opposite reaction, and, and I'm not going to say this too. There's also the part, the quiet part out loud. And that's the lobbying that happens, right? When you really know about how the sausage gets made, whether it's this country or other countries, you know, there's there's people who spend a lot of money for lobbyists uh, to make sure that they can and continue to earn uh, money and continue to be able to sell cars. So there's that piece of it, too, that I don't want it to get lost. It's more than just the marketing that happens during the Super Bowl. You know, it, it really is the systems in place. And, and that's kind of some of the I, I'll say I don't want to get into like too deep into it, but it's some of the challenges of capitalism. Capitalism is I want to continue to earn money. And so I will find ways to continue to earn money and I will rig the system so I continue to earn money. But that's a separate podcast, you know, but for the for our purposes, it really isn't surprising to me. One of the things and part of the reason why I wrote Chapter six, which is the task ahead it's the it, it is very easy in this country, and I'm not going to get into the partisanness of the politics, but it's very easy to think of look at a at a state and be like, oh, Florida gonna Florida and Texas gonna Texas. And I think what people are missing is they're they're the test sites, right? The thing about Florida and the thing about Texas, it's demographically, they're, they're pretty representative of the United States in terms of just the different ethnicities, languages. They're very similar in that way. California, to some extent as well. And so what happens is they become test beds. And you can see it with different issues that have occurred over the, the last couple of years. It's a test of how far can I push um, and what can I get away with? And so I wrote chapter six because I don't think a lot of people know that in the, the last Texas legislature, there was a bill introduced to prevent road diets. And it was very specific and it was about the freedom to move and, you know, don't impend on my freedom, you know, and, and all these like kind of language. And it's like, you can, you can still move. And it fortunately didn't move forward, but for the Texas legislature only meets for a narrow window of time. So at some point they have to prioritize their, the ridiculousness of it all. But I will say, while it was introduced by one political party, I actually think it could have gotten bi bipartisan support. And so I wrote chapter six because for the advocacy group, they can sometimes get so bogged down by one project and hold on so tightly to one project that you can miss the bigger picture. 
And if we're not paying attention, if we're not communicating across states, this is some, that's a legislation that could easily start to pop up in other states. And I think as you look at the, the, the prime minister, as we go back to kind of full, start, full um, circle where that question started, you can see that there is something that speaks to people, right? It's all about emotion, right? It's egos, lath- egos logos, pathos. I remember that from my English 101. And so the pathos of it, you know, you getting into the emotion of it all. And it's like, yeah, I sit in traffic and it's easy to blame everyone else for why you're sitting in traffic. Meanwhile, you are the traffic. You are literally part of the traffic, you know, and it's easy to blame. Oh, you took away a lane. You took something. You're taking it away from me. And so now I'm in more traffic than what I would have been. Um, And I don't want to make any other choices. And now I feel like you're engineering me to make a different decision. And I don't want to make any other decision. And I think especially this sentiment, I, I feel this is just kind of me, my observation. I feel like the whole vaccine and COVID is like made this, you know, social engineering, like more of a thing. It's like, oh, you're trying to social engineer me into doing something. And it's like, no, it's not about that. You can, can, you can continue to drive. No one is taking away that option. It's we are trying to give options to other people who want other options. And especially for young people, sorry, sorry. And especially for young people, because the data is there. These young people don't want to drive. I don't really, like, they're not getting their driver's license. They are choosing not to drive. And I even share in the book, you know, I got my driver's license two days after my birthday and that 48 hours was a killer having to wait 48 whole hours to get my driver's license. But these, these young, they just don't want to drive. And you're talking well into their 20s without having a driver's license, um, let alone anything else. And then if you think about most college towns, you know, even I went to, as I mentioned, I went to Ithaca, New York. Ithaca, New York is in the middle of nowhere. It is literally in the middle of nowhere. It is 30 strong country miles, you know, from the interstate. And yet it is probably one of the most walkable communities. I could go a week without even moving my car because of the transit system, even into the middle of the night. There was always a bus, always the ability to move. And that's in the middle of nowhere. And so co- most college towns are very walkable or bikeable or have really great transit systems. So really, these kids are like, I don't really have to think about it. Maybe when I hit my 20s, I'll get my driver's license. And then they've all discovered Uber. And so they use Uber and Lyft and all the different other ride shares to get around. And so they're like, eh, why, why, get, a, why get a license? Why get a car I can't afford yeah. Yeah. And and we're recording this on uh, Monday, uh, October 16th. And so, you know, this past weekend here in Austin, we had the Austin uh, City Limits uh, ACL Music Festival. And the other thing that the youngins are doing is they're getting around by e-scooters and other micro mobility devices. And we see them, you know, when you're you're talking about bringing in nearly 100,000 people, you know, to uh, a, a venue site, a music venue site every day for six days across two weekends. You know, that's, you know, 450 some odd thousand people, you know, the coming to the event, you can't park anywhere. There's no there's no way for somebody to drive to to the venue site. So you see lots of people on e-scooters, lots of people on bikes, lots of people using pedicabs and uh, and transit even is is getting heavy usage. And it's like, oh, yeah, this and, you know, there, there's a natural inclination to be able to do that. So we have hope. We have hope. And it does make me think, too, when you were talking about, you know, sort of that rationale that was happening by the British prime minister and then also uh, what took place at the state ledge here in, in Texas. I get a sense that some of this is like playing politics to the base. I think some of it is because. Again, it comes down to this, the, the politics of these people, right? It's always mm-hmm. these, people these people are trying to get you to change your life. They don't like you. They don't like the lifestyle that you have. They don't like the choices that you make. They don't like that you live in the suburbs in your house. They don't like that you're driving to work. And so they are trying to change you. And you see it with zoning. Oh my gosh, you see it with zoning, right? Where it's like these, where communities are like, no, 
Why would anybody want to ever live in a townhome? Just because you don't want to live in a townhome doesn't mean other people don't want to live in a townhome. You know, and there's been cities where um, they've tried to just change ordinances or zoning and people are emotional about it. Um, I'll never forget there was an apartment building in D.C., where there was going to be a basement and then a sub basement, which was going to be rentable space. And like people in the community were like, like, why? No, you can't have people living like that. And so some people were like, hey, I would love to live like that because I work night shift and I would love to be in a nice dark apartment, you know, so I can actually sleep. And then it's like this like offensiveness of like, how could you We can't allow people to live like that. And so it's this interesting dictating of lifestyle, right? So you can have one group that wants to dictate a lifestyle and anybody that's choosing something different, it's like as a personal offense. Um, And again, I think that the, you know, COVID and all of that just exasperated all of that. Um, And then I think that just overall, Again, not to weigh too deep into politics, but I think the political divide, even within families, it feels like everything is you just don't like me and everything I stand for because kids, the kids are saying, no, I want to live in a diverse city. I want to live in an apartment mainly because I can't afford a house. Right. This house that you bought for one hundred eighty five thousand, you know, 30 years ago is now a million dollar home. Thanks, mom. I can't afford to live in this community. So let me go let me go have a different lifestyle until, you know, the younger people are making different choices. And I think it's just this, I don't know, people, it's just this, people want to be offended about something. (laughs) I love that too. I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, it's, it's, that's part of the reason why in politics we do see both sides sort of playing to their bases to levels of extreme because you know if you can villainize the other side you know then you can get you you can rally the troops and and be able to do that i i love the image that we have on screen here um uh, for the listening audience can you describe this particular image because this is the core image uh on the cover of the book and i think from this image a lot of what we just talked about sort of gets teased apart and, you know, is debunked a little. Yeah. And so the funny, funny backstory is actually a different cover originally. And uh, my second round of editing team was like, no, 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 this cover won't do. (laughs) It doesn't speak to it. And I'm going to say just big picture zooming out. What I love about the image more than anything is that there's no buildings. And it's very intentional in that it's not about the buildings, right? Right. It's It doesn't really matter because once you put buildings, then people are going to be like, oh, is that New York? Is that this? Is that that? And it's just like, no, it's just a building. And people can then try to root it in. It's a city. It's a this, it's a that. And with some elements, it, you know, it may still invoke big city feels, but it was very intentional to not have buildings. So therefore people could put the buildings there that they need to put to see it in their community. And so really it was about the inclusiveness. So there are people still choosing to drive. There's even a car, you know, driving with the the top down, you know, Um, and. And and, and, and that speaks to the joy of driving. And the joy of driving and they're driving around. Uh, There's even the little kind of what looks like a smart car or whatever they used to call those cars. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know if they, do they still exist? I, the, yeah, I, 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 I do, right? I'm not sure if the actual company smart cars still exist, but these are the really the, micro the micro shape. cars. Yes, yes, right. The micro There's cars. the little two person cars. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so it has that because that some people are like, hey, I live alone. It's just me and my dog. You know, fluffy, and we just need to get around. I need a little car that I can park parallel park on the street. And the, and I will tell you when I don't know if you guys remember the the brand was a car to go that had them, and they like dropped them all over the cities. Man, you could park those things anywhere. Yeah. No, we like, used them here I, in, in, in Austin. Oh, yeah. yeah. You yeah. can park those things anywhere, but I digress. Um, but it also has um, people. And so there's, you know, um, two people riding in a pedicab, some on a Vespa. Uh, there's people biking. Um, and it was very intentional that we didn't have people in Lycra. And, and, and if you notice, none of the people biking have helmets. Right, right. Because we're talking about a future existence and... You know, not to say that helmets um, don't help, 
but it's not the end all be all. We all know that better bike infrastructure and more people biking does more to make it safer than helmets. And so the, the people biking don't have helmets because they're biking for to get to somewhere. Right. Um, a lot of people walking around. So everything from a delivery person, um, someone in a wheelchair, someone pushing a baby carriage, um, someone walking their dog. So just all different types of people, uh, someone walking with a cane, yeah. just to um, take in, in, in the fact that there's all different types of people within an area and they're all moving around and everyone has space available for them to be able to move and make the decisions that they need to make. They can take a taxi, they could take a pedicab, there's a bike share in the background, like they could walk. There are are plenty of options uh, for them to move. And I think that to me is what it's about at the end of the day. Yeah. And, you know, from a functional perspective, we've even got a, a work van there. So, you know, that's mm-hmm. that's also being uh, taken care of. And so what we're seeing in this representation, in this illustration, is something that we talked about earlier, which was freedom and choice. Mm-hmm. It really is. I mean, and I think that to me, that is what in, it, it is, inclusivity is about. It, it really is about having the many choices available to you to move how you need to move. And what's really important, because I think this is another kind of driver mindset. So the driver mindset is if I drive to work, then I have to drive home. Otherwise my car stays at work. That's just the basics of it. Yeah. But you could bike to work and take a bus home, right? Or you can you could drive to a park and ride and then take the bus the rest of the way. Like you can chain and you don't have to, you're not beheld, beholden, beholden, beheld, whatever. You're not, you're not confined. I'm not an English major. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we did mention this is a Monday morning. That's right. Um, but you're not confined to one way to move. And that is the beauty about being multimodal. I remember I lived in DC without a car for probably about eight years. Mm -hmm. And it was great because I always made sure I had money on my smart trip card because I could take the bus. I could take Metro and then take another bus or I could take Metro and then I could walk. You know, I could take bike share when bike share was in, you know, came around or I could use my own bike. And then if I didn't feel like biking up the hill, guess what? I put it on the front of the bus. Yeah. But all of that is options. We talked earlier about the car to go that used to exist and, you know, in zip car. And so there was the ability to have a car if I actually if I really needed one. Right. Um, But otherwise, you know, I just moved around. And even, you know, when my husband and I uh, got married and and, and lived, uh, we did have a car, but we often forget where we parked the car. If it wasn't right (laughs) in front of the house, we're like, I don't know where the car is. We'd have to go like hunting the neighborhood (laughs) to find the car because we just didn't drive. We put more miles driving from Houston, uh, DC to Houston than we did in two years in DC. And it's just, we didn't have to. And there again, there was options available for how we moved. And, and at the end of the day, that's really what it's about. It's just providing people as many options as they, they can, they need in order to move around. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the, the interesting things too, of when, it, cause you mentioned it with the, the younger generations who are uh, sort of leaning into this car light sort of lifestyle and, uh, you know, wanting that uh, opportunity. And then the university setting oftentimes sort of reinforces that because like Ithaca, you know, Ann Arbor is where I did my master's degree. You know, they're inherently very walkable, uh, bikeable sort of communities. And so you get that reinforcement of, uh, especially for, you know, maybe kids that grew up in dependent suburban contexts where they had to get shuttled around everywhere. And so all suddenly they're like, oh, wow, I don't have to beg for a ride from the parents. You know, I can literally or until I get my driver's license, you know, when they're 16 or 17 or whatever. Uh, but like you said, a lot of them are not even going forward and getting their driver's license. Then it gets reinforced in college. And then you had that opportunity of being able to, to work uh, in an urban context, in an urban environment where you didn't need a car so much. Maybe you had it, maybe it was there as a backstop, but on a day-to-day basis, you were able to, uh, to get around DC because of mobility choice. 
Mm-hmm. And so one thing I said, while we do have the cover up, I do want to give a shout out to the artist of the cover. Uh, Martin Schmoll is the one who created the cover. So I do want to give that shout out. But I think it's it's a couple of things as, as we look back at to the younger generation, we what we are seeing, it's compounding issues. And if we don't face them, I believe we will end up with a housing crisis. And I don't go too deep into housing, but um, we do have a risk of a housing crisis and, and and other things. So one, you have to look at these younger people. So they grew up in a world where they have been connected to the entire world their entire life. I am probably the beginning of the, the tiny beginning of the internet generation, but really by the, you know, but for me, I was the first, first, at least for Maryland, I was the first group where everyone even just had internet in their ethernet at the time, you know, in their, in their dorm room. Um, so I'm just at the beginning, but if you look at this younger generation, they have been connected their entire life. They've had social media their entire life. They are learning things off of TikTok. Um, like literally, I have heard someone say, like, you know, they, you know, it was a it was a TikTok of these kids learning how to cut bangs by looking at another TikTok. So they are that is how they are learning, and they're connected into the world in a way that many of us weren't. So they are very aware of what's happening. You can try to ban all the books you want. They can get act. They have a phone. They're going to get access to whatever book you don't want them to read. They probably have more knowledge of the world of what's going on than many of us that are working and they're paying attention. And so there is an awareness of these younger people, I think, compound it with housing. If you look at housing, I mentioned earlier, um, you have houses now selling for a million dollars and you have a boomer generation that's like, why won't you buy your house? And it's like, yeah, a starter home, you know, for a boomer was like $35,000, right? That same house today is probably a half a million. And you're like, why won't these, they can't afford it. You know, even for people in my cohort, they can't afford it. And they're saddled with student loans, but for by God go, I I don't have any student loans, but you know, you have, I have so many friends right now in their forties, their late thirties that still have, you know, six figures of student loans. And that's a whole other separate set of a Ponzi scheme. If we we really want to call it that, Yeah, yeah. you know, and so you have these younger people that have, have debt out the wazoo. If you look at where the jobs are, the jobs are largely going to be in the urban areas. So they're going to move to the urban areas. And many of them are living in apartments, uh, maybe two bedroom apartments with four people or they're renting houses. And I saw this a lot in D.C. where you rent a house and then you have multiple people in a room and it's almost kind of like a informal group home, if you will. And that's how they're affording. And so they're already stretching to pay for housing. They got these student loans. Who wants to own a car on top of that? We just talked about the fact that, you know, car ownership, you're looking at $400, $500 a month. And that's for car note, gas, insurance, you know, all those things, parking tickets, because if you live in an urban area, you're probably going to get a parking ticket. And so just the expense of it. And so people are saying, you know what? Nope, I'm just going to I'll just bite. Um, and even in cities like like the Houston's of the world, the Dallas is the Fort Worth's, you are seeing younger people that are saying that are living carless in these cities. And it's very difficult for them, um, but they're still making that choice. But for that, it's just they can't afford a car. And then, you know, and then again, you go back to housing, they can't afford housing. And so you do have people. What's really popular here is three bedrooms, two bathrooms, and people are choosing to raise multiple kids in a three bedroom, two bathroom. And it's, I will sacrifice space because I can walk to the park. I can, you know, walk to multiple parks. I can get to, I can get to everything I need if I live in this community and I will sacrifice space in order to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So you just mentioned parking tickets. And so I had, I have to pull something viral up. That's going viral right now. It's this dude. (laughs) And your, 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 your response was just like, was bruh, bruh. Bruh. Oh. <laughs> go ahead and set it up. Woo. Okay. So one thing about the district of Columbia, they going to get, they go, they go, you going to pay into compliance. So uh, obviously we've, a lot of cities have red light cameras or speed cameras. Um, but in DC, there are stop sign cameras. If you don't come to a complete stop, you'll get a ticket. It's probably like $200 or so. Yeah. Because uh, I, I will say just a little nuance in the law, 
because you can't verify who's driving, it is actually gets written as a parking ticket. So all, all automated traffic enforcement in the District of Columbia is considered a parking ticket, which means if you don't pay it, you can't get booted and towed. Separate, separate, whole separate issue. And so what we see in this video, um, so the person in the... <laughs> The person who shared this out is um, a person actually uh, listens to a lot of the police scanners and, and gets a lot of information out to the community uh, about what's happening. And so he is driving down the street and there's a stop sign and he does a rolling stop. And so what he's saying is, you know, D.C. is fine me two hundred dollars. Should I pay or contest? And most people are like, you got to pay up like you dude. did not come to a stop like, dude, like for real. Like you didn't even like you touched the brakes, sure, right. <laughs> but you did not. The car did not come to a complete stop. And one of the things I do want to say, so one of the people um, that did comment, who I actually is one of my um, mentees through uh, the Women's Transportation Seminar, and she and I used to meet a lot about um, about five six years ago. And one of the things that she commented was her daughter uh, and her husband were on a bike and they were hit just one block away, and it was a vehicle doing a rolling stop. Yeah. And so it is this importance. It's this like sense of like, but it, I, I tried. And a lot of people don't see anything that's wrong with a rolling stop. But the reality is you may not see what you think you see. Um, and, and it is important to come to a complete stop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, ha I had to pull that up because you've mentioned that. And, and again, that that went viral over the weekend out on Twitter slash X, whatever we want to call it. So I, I thought it would be fun to, to to pull that up real quick. So you know, getting back to the, this, you know, this image and, and, and I wasn't real. I didn't realize that was the artist, Martin uh, uh, Schmoll. So thank you very much for pointing that out. Really. When I look at this, I, you know, from an active town's perspective, again, I'm, I'm looking at the built environment that is uh, providing uh, activity assets, safe and inviting activity assets that helps encourage people to live their best lives. And as you had mentioned, a person who wants to drive, enjoys driving, like the person in the, in the convertible there, uh, the three people in the convertible there, you know, they can do so. It's, it's there. People who need to drive and have work uh, that they need to do, like the person in the van, you know, is able to do it. There's, there's taxis represented here. And so I look at this as sort of our best representation of, from a mobility perspective, of showing dignity to everybody whether there's somebody in a wheelchair who can you know choose to get around either in the protected bike lane or on the sidewalk uh, and also is currently in sort of the refuge island area as this is uh, depicted at the moment. But I look at this as inclusive. I look at this as showing dignity to all ages and all abilities. And this is really, you know, sort of the, the pinnacle as to where I would like to see us get to and embrace this and not be afraid of this. From your perspective, why, why is this fearful for some people? I think there's a fearfulness and I think it comes back to power because it can feel like I am ceding power to the others that are in this particular image. Because one of the things as you zoom in, there is a person who is wearing a religious a head, you know, head turban. And there's all different types of people. There is someone wearing a mask. And it's again, and no one really has a face because it doesn't really matter, but it's all different shades. And so for some people, that is scary. What I also love is there's a woman, you know, looking at her cell phone crossing the street. And how many times do we try to blame the pedestrian for distracted walking? But imagine a place so safe that someone can just walk across the street, even if they are, you know, plastered to their cell phone and be able to get across the street safely. And so for, I don't know, for some people, it's very fearful um, and largely because these are going to be in mostly urban areas. And there's always been an otherness about the urban area. I remember when I was in um, planning, so I had to read a book by uh, Gerald Frug, I think Frug, R R F R U G, on regionalism. And it talked about how people from the suburbs like to come to the cities to get culture, but they want it in a very curated manner. They want to get culture from a museum or from an art festival. But 
the streets are culture. Yeah. Right. Like that is all still part of the culture. And so people can say like, you know, I grew up in New Jersey right outside of New York. And so, you know, I did spend my time commuting to New York, lower Manhattan, as I mentioned earlier, to New York City DOT. And, you know, there's this like, oh, people from the north are cold. Like that might be so. Right. Like no one in New York is trying to smile or wave at you, but let you fall on the street of New York. And those New Yorkers are going to come and help you and get you to where you need to be. It is a sense of a community, right? If you need help, if you don't need help, I got you, keep moving. But if you need help, we're going to be there for you. And I think you saw that with 9-11 and and, and all the other, you know, things that have happened in New York where it is a community that comes together. And that's part of living in a city. It's it's the culture is the street. Somebody was uh, recently talking about how New York has changed. And again, it's people who move to New York for the culture and then try to change the culture. Um, There was uh, an article about Harlem and how people were, you know, gentrification was happening in Harlem and people were moving to Harlem and then complaining about the noise of Harlem. And it's like, but that is the culture, you know? And so again, there's this otherness, there's this culture that people really don't want to be a part of. They they want it curated. I'll never forget, I worked for um, a city outside of DC and I'll never forget, we were working on the uh, waterfront plan. And I, I, it's like a, it's it's like one of those, like, did this person just say this out loud? And so this person, um, this is supposed to be a enlightened community, a progressive community. And they said, oh, no, 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 we we like diversity. We just would like for it to be high end. And I was like, what? what is high end diversity? They're like, oh, yeah, we want like first at the time, first lady, first lady, Michelle Obama. Like that is the type of diversity we, we want to attract. And so, again, I think that that's part of what you see at this, like people look at urban areas, they're dirty, they're grimy. It's it's even in the language around, you know, safety, it's like Chicago. It's 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 like a it's Chirac. But even when you present people with numbers of, hey, these rural towns are actually probably you're more likely to get shot and killed in this rural town than you are in Chicago. It doesn't matter. It's cities are very scary places. Yeah. And so that just also just continues to, to, to manifest in some of this conversation. One of the things that I like about this particular image and, and you mentioned it earlier is the fact that there is no representation of the housing stock in the buildings in the area. And the reason I like that is because it does focus and hone in on the street. And I, I, I think it's, because the context really does matter in terms of, yes, you know, is this a suburban environment? Is this uh, an urban landscape? But at the same time, if we if we step take a step back and we, we don't focus in on that, it's like, well, it's about the street. It's about how we're able to uh, redefine what the street is for. I mean, you've probably noticed my coffee cup here. Streets are for people in my little mantra that I try to keep, you know, up at the forefront of active towns is that this manifestation that we see in our streets right now is relatively recent. In the last 100 years, 120 years, the streets were taken over by an interloper, the automobile. Prior to that, for thousands of years, streets were for people and streets were where people came together and where commerce took place and where you had chance meetings and all of these wonderful things that is humanity, as well as brushing shoulders with people who don't look like you and don't sound mm-hmm. like you and are, don't have the same abilities as you. And this Absolutely. Is so, yeah. And this is such a, a, an, incre- an incredible part. And, and part of your mm-hmm. book even talks about having empathy. T- mm-hmm. Talk a little bit more about that in this context. Yeah. And so while we do that, I am going to ask you to pull up my uh, picture of Maplewood, New Jersey, okay. um, that I love to use. So this is a picture from the New York Times. It shows uh, Maplewood, New Jersey. So I'm from a small town. It is a little bitty bedroom community of New York. And it's an older suburb. So it was very much a colonial town. There's a street called Roosevelt Boulevard that the the Roosevelts, you know, participated in building some of the gates around that. But one of the things that you see, and this is the downtown area of my little community. And yes, people drove to the downtown area, but it was very much and it was very clear that people could be walking and you will go slow and the fines will be severe if you even remotely hit a pedestrian. And I can tell you growing up, 
I don't recall. I can't think of in any instance of a car crash or a pedestrian being struck in this little, you know, strip of town. I have never seen it. I'm not going to say it's never happened, but you know, in the um, I lived there from five to eighteen, and that was thirteen years. I can't recall a time that I ever saw a crash or anything of that nature. And part of it is, um, and it's very similar to this street where you have really great sidewalks. It's a very walkable community. And so I think that sometimes small towns forget that they're actually pretty walkable. Yeah. Um, and so and so I do want to share that as we talk about the different communities and even as my town resisted to change, um, but has changed. The post office is now a, you know, an apartment building, which was like, you know, it was a big it was a big, long battle. Um, But even with that, it is still very much a walkable uh, town. And that's how I grew up. And and there's a train that takes you right into New York City. But even as talk as I talk about empathy, you know, it really is. And part of the reason why I start the book off with people telling their own story, it's, you know, self-awareness is going to be your most effective tool. If you don't know who you are, you can't deal with anybody else. And so it really is taking that time to understand yourself, to love yourself too, but to understand yourself and not to get too biblical, but I think people misuse the like, love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? And so how do you love your neighbor if you don't have any love for who you are as an individual and you don't know who you are? And that's where I start the book off with understanding your transportation story. Just, and it doesn't have to be anything dramatic, just how do you, why do you make the choices that you make? And there's probably different reasons for that. And then I end and I talk about empathy and it's about how can you truly just decenter yourself? Because diversity, equity, inclusion is important, but you can't put that on that person to do the work. What are you willing to do? What are you willing to understand about how other people move? And it doesn't have to be this performative thing, right? It doesn't have to be even hard because I know books are hard. And so I shared, I love sci-fi books. I love to read fiction. Yeah. And so what I do is I take the time to seek out fiction books written by people from other communities, whether it's um, LBGTQ, whether it is people uh, with a disability, but it's centering a different type of character And what you get in a fiction book, especially if it's a first person fiction, is you get their thoughts. And oftentimes that author, if they are from, you know, if they're from that particular community, they're going to put their thoughts in there about different things that make them anxious. So one book I read, I'll never forget, it was a dystopian future. And one of the main characters was a transgender woman. And so there was this fear um, that you hear in the book of, okay, the world's about to end. I'm trying to figure out how I save myself. But then even as I save myself, I'm concerned about my personal safety as I get on this ship, right? And so it's a dystopian. It's the fear that most people would have if we knew that the world was ending coupled with all these other kind of elements. And I will say, you know, as a black woman, it's a concern of like, oh shoot, it's a ship of all like white people. I don't want to go on this ship. I'll wait till the next one, (laughs) you know? And so it's all these, it's, it's all the different emotions that you get. And so those are ways that you can get insight into people. It's really about centering other people and understanding someone else's world. I think that you know, even as you look at, um, I, I follow on Twitter, for example, disability Twitter is like the most like eye opening yeah. conversations to have. And I don't necessarily participate in the conversation because I don't really have anything to add, but I sit back and observe. And it's all the little things of even disagreements within the disability community, because sometimes accommodating one disability impacts another disability. Right. And so it's it's keeping that in mind. It's it, it sometimes we go to the wheelchair and it's like that's one type. But you have people who have different sensitivities or different, you know, they take in stimuli different around the world. And that's a type of disability. And so while we have added an accessible pedestrian signal that can chirp to let a person who is visually impaired know that it's time to cross the street for someone who is neurodivergent, that yep. chirping might trigger something in them or overstimulate. And so it's been just fascinating to think about all of these challenges and having a certain level of empathy for all of these different challenges of of how different people experience the world. And the more that you are aware of that, you can make mistakes and and it's okay. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to say you don't know. 
Um, but it's taking the time to continue to push through and understand. And, and, and it's really fascinating. And I think the more that you can do that, the more you will find that as an individual, you just become a more open person to a lot of a lot of things. But I'm also very clear that even with empathy, and there is a really, really great quote by James Baldwin. I'm, I'm, I'm Googling it real quick. So I don't want to mess up this quote. Hold on, hold on. Let me, give me, give me two seconds. Because it's, it's a quote. It says, okay, here it is. So James Baldwin, he said, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. Yeah. Um, and so I am very clear about that. Like, I'm going to have some empathy. But then there's going to be a point where if your thoughts and your opinions cause me harm or potential harm, then we don't need to. There, there, I, I, I don't have empathy for you. I don't want I don't want to cause you harm. I wish you well in life, but I don't want I don't have empathy for that. Yeah. To close us out. One of the my favorite parts of the book was the, the fact that at, at some point in time, I don't remember exactly where it was in the book, but you, you basically got to the point of saying, you, we just can't keep having endless conversations and endless meetings and having these conversations just so that we can check off something on the box to say we had this conversation. It's like, if we're going to be serious about Vision Zero, if we're going to be serious about creating walkable, bikeable communities at some point in time, we need to move forward and do it with a certain sense of humbleness and having empathy for the fact that it's going to be potentially even triggering for some people uh, because change is hard. But at some point in time, we, we got to get we got to get cracking. We got to get moving. I mean, there's people dying on our streets and the planet's burning up. <laughs> so talk a little bit about that to close us out is at some point in time, we, we got to get moving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I talk a lot about that in chapter five and I made one of a very controversial statement. I was like, sometimes there's no such, th sometimes you're not going to get consensus. Right. Like, full stop. Yes. And I think it's like hard because every planner is like, no, we've been taught like, no, we're going to get everybody in the room and we're going to do all this great engagement and we're going to get there. You're not going to get there. There are going to be times you are just not going to get there. And it's okay. And so it's almost kind of like, I don't know if you ever did like Robert's Rules of Order. And, you know, there's oh, yeah. different types of motions and there's some that aren't debatable and some that are debatable. I mean, I think I, I was I almost, was the parliamentarian in 4-H. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I'm a, I'm a big stickler, too. Yeah. Um, and so the thing about Robert's Rules is that there's some things that aren't debatable motions. You know, we could just are we, we going to do it or are we going to not? And I feel like we have to treat some projects like that. It is not debatable. And I talk about that, like sidewalks as an example. I don't care whatever city I have ever worked in, sidewalks are the hardest infrastructure project to do. Right. Harder than anything else that I've ever done. Sidewalks yeah. are the hardest. And, and, what's, it, and, it, what's, and what's interesting, we should pause on that a little bit because I happen to live in a neighborhood where we don't have sidewalks. Uh, it was platted in the 1930s. Uh, you know, by the time these houses were built, it was right immediately after World War II. Right, right immediately after World War II, we were very poor. <laughs> you know, it wasn't until the 50s before things started going. And so there were no sidewalks planned in this area. We'll probably never have sidewalks on these streets because now we have heritage trees that we are beloved growing in that eight foot area there continue. That's part of the context of why oh, it can be hard to put in sidewalks. That and then people don't, I, just, I don't want people walking in front of my house because then they might rob me. Someone, a bad person might come from across the city and walk in front of my house and rob me. Like they are going to walk out with a 75 inch TV and just walk down the street with it. But oh, and we, we hear the same thing about, you know, multi-use paths that are going, you know, you know, oh, in, in along the, the canal or whatever, the bayou yep. uh, down in, in Houston. And the same thing will be said. Yes. The infamous boogeyman. And so they're very, very hard to put in. And I know that um, some cities have a law where you have to have a sidewalk on at least one side of the street. And I'll never forget, in D.C., it got to the point where everyone's like, oh, I agree. We should have sidewalks on that side of the street. And so then they passed a law. OK, since since you guys want to do this now, both sides have to have a sidewalk. And so we have to say, is that a debatable motion? Right. 
it's, it should not be debatable, especially when you're talking about kids having to walk in the street to get to school. Like that doesn't make sense. And I have seen schools, even where kids live in walking distance and that that drop off line, like, why are we like, why are we OK with a drop off line a mile long of parents sitting there idling for hours? Right. Because to then be at the front of the drop off line, you have to get there an hour before drop off. So you now have wasted an hour of your time to get in the front of the drop off line to then you know, idle, maybe, even if you turn your car off just to get your child to go home, let your child walk home. And especially when I see that at a middle school and a high school, like, what are we doing? Are we yeah. okay with this? And I think that we, we, we do have to have a certain, a level of empathy of understanding that in a, in a car brain society, um, we do have to, at certain, at a certain level, you know, cut, those parents for that logical and somewhat practical decision to do what they're doing in the context that they're in. But your point is, is that if we have made these decisions, these, this is what we're going to do. Let's use, let's stick with the schools and use, a, you know, school zone as an example and saying, mm-hmm. yeah, every single elementary and middle school should have a zone around it where it, it's inherently walkable and bikeable for kids mm-hmm. to be able to get around. It's like, okay, we're no longer going to continue to debate this ad nauseum. We're going to like implement. <laughs> exactly. And it, and it's very challenging. And I'll say that this is where I also talk about having bold leadership is important. Electing better leaders is also important. One thing I will say about, you know, my, my current position is so, you know, mayor Turner is, his he's un- you know, his term's coming to an end. Right. Um, but one thing I appreciate about him is he is a decisive leader um, because there have been very sticky situations that I'm telling you, I've worked in so many cities across the country that m- most other mayors, 99.9% of all the other mayors I ever worked with would have either said, well, let's think about it. Let's put a pause Let's um, do more engagement and in order to get the project done. This mayor said, okay, let me go see for myself. And we showed him the end, you know, the street. We walked through what it is, we walked through the issues. And then the mayor put out a four-minute video about why this was gonna move forward. Yeah. You know, and, and that is decisive leadership. And so that's again in chapter six, I talk about this. It's you need to have bold leaders. But I am able to make hard decisions because I know that my boss and my boss's boss are not going to overturn my position, my my decisions. If I can defend it, yeah. they're not going to overturn my decision. So it enables me when you look at Jeanette Sada Khan and everything that she did in New York City, it was because the mayor had her back. If she had come up with everything and the mayor said, no, 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 we can't do it this way. We can't do it this way. We would not have the Times Square that we have today. Um, So you need to have really good people that are running these Department of Transportation that are making the decisions. But you also have to have good elected leaders. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And that means you need to put out your criteria and you need to put them on notice. Because if you don't have good elected leaders, it doesn't matter who you have sitting in the seats that I occupy. And you do address that uh, at the end of the book of talking about the need for bold leaders and, and leadership. And, and you've got other uh, wonderful leaders down there. Uh, Harris County, a good friend of mine, uh, Rodney Ellis, uh, you know, Commissioner Ellis. is Now, y- you you actually a few years ago uh, had a situation where you sort of, you know, kicked the hornet's nest a little bit. And and uh, w- wasn't there something about like a, a sticker about Lycra and then you were the only person who showed up without Lycra? Oh, so- so, yeah, so first of all, on my bike, I have uh, several stickers. I have one that says build better cities yeah. on my bike. Yeah. Uh, I have one. I bike because I'm awesome. I'm a hill killer is another one. Um, but I have also on there. Friends don't let friends wear Lycra. Yeah. yeah. Um, a commissioner Ellis. So I met him when he was a state senator. Um, uh, gosh, I don't remember what year it was. It was it was several years ago. Uh, and I think it was almost nine, 10 years ago. But anyway, um, so he came to DC um, and he wanted to bike ride while he was there. He was, he was into biking. I can't take credit for getting him into biking. He was into biking before. 
Um, but he came to DC and he wanted to bike around. And so we took him around DC to different infrastructure. Black Women Bike did. And so we have a really great photo. But yeah, everyone's in Lycra. I'm in jeans because I just had this thing. I refused. Even when I used to bike with Black Women Bike, yeah. it was, I would, it, it would, it, you couldn't get me in spandex because yeah, I'm just yeah. not that type of cyclist. God yeah. bless. And again, it's about choice. Right. So I'm not taking away your choice. You know, the friends that we're friends let, let like her is just a, is a tongue in cheek. It's a fun, it's a fun, it's a fun little thing. It's a fun, it's a fun well, now, place. hey, yes. And now that I know that you love stickers, I need to make sure to get your address so oh, I can please. send you yeah. uh, a Streets Are For People uh, sticker. Veronica O. Davis, Inclusive Transportation. Uh, folks, please pick up the book. It is an absolute joy. Thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you for having me. It's been a great conversation. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, it'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content, please consider supporting my efforts out on Patreon. Uh, all patrons do get access to this content early and ad free. So there's that really nice bonus and you get to join my merry band of active towns and ambassadors. You can also support my efforts on uh, Buy Me A Coffee, a YouTube super thanks right down below, as well as buying things from the Active Town store. I've got all sorts of good stuff out there, including some Streets Are For People swag, t-shirts, water bottles, coffee mugs, all that good stuff. Uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in. It really means so much to me. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.